Hi there. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to the uh, panel on psychiatric targets, finally new mechanisms, or ne new mechanisms, question mark. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm Gideon Gill. I'm the moderator. I'm the health and science editor at the Boston Globe. Um, and um, last fall at MIT, um, I heard uh, Francis Collins, the NIH director, speak. And um, he said that um, we are uh, it, 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 at a stage in ne understanding neuroscience uh, that we were uh, in understanding evolution before Darwin. So in other words, we don't even, we don't understand the basic underlying principles underlying the way the brain works. Um, also at MIT, and, and I should stop and apologize for those, all the Harvard folks in the audience here, uh, but I'm uh, doing a Night Science Journalism Fellowship at MIT this year, so I'm, uh, I'm getting inundated with the MIT folks. But anyway, um, also at MIT, um, I uh, was in a neuroengineering class with uh, Professor Ed Boyden, uh, and he, basically, the whole theme of the class was that much or most of what we think we know about the brain is probably going to turn out to be wrong. So it's hardly surprising that, uh, that psychiatric treatments are often inadequate. Early di diagnosis is difficult. Misdiagnosis is frequent, and there are no objective tests to help us predict individual responses to treatment. Uh, so what's being done about this? We have a great distinguished panel with us today to tell us about promising developments in the world of psychiatry. Uh, to my left uh, is uh, Deborah Dunshire. She's the chief executive officer of Forum Pharmaceuticals, which is developing treatments for schizophrenia, Alzheimer's, and frontotemporal dementia. Uh, next to her is uh, Maurizio Fava. He's the executive vice chair of the uh, Mass General Hospital Psychiatry. Uh, he's also the Slater Family Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, and his research focuses on depression. Uh, to his left and your right is Corey McCann, founder and CEO of Pair Therapeutics, which is an e-health company developing drug and software combination products for diseases of the brain. And at the far end is uh, David Silberschweig, who's chairman of psychiatry at Brigham and Women's Hospital, where he's co-director of the Institute for the Neurosciences. He's also the Stanley Cobb Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. His research focuses on functional brain imaging. Uh, I should also, uh, before we go further, tell you that we're going to be taking questions during the session through YORN, and this is session number 213, 213. Uh, so to get started here, I want to turn uh, Ask David if you would provide us with sort of a quick overview and context of where we are in the psychiatric field. Where have we been? Where are we today? And where it's going? So you gave a very humbling, appropriately humbling introduction in the context of what we don't know. And of course, one always worries about not knowing what one doesn't know on top of that. Um, that said, I think we are learning a lot in the last few decades in particular that puts psychiatry more firmly in the medical sphere as a biologically based discipline, while at the same time understanding the psychosocial aspects and ramifications and even causes in some cases, because as we've heard from this conference and in the context of epigenetics and plasticity, the brain evolved to mediate interactions with the environment, including social interactions, as well as to orchestrate as the highest order orchestrator of uh, our own bodily functions. And these things come together in important ways that we're starting to understand the circuitry of now. In that context, functional brain imaging has added to animal studies in important ways. Uh, you can't model a number of these diseases, although you can model certain mechanisms very nicely and certain aspects very nicely in animal models. But at the end of the day, psychiatric disease is a confluence of higher order neocortex that's more recently evolved and that is involved in executive functions and existential sorts of uh, abstract elements. And at the same time, limbic and subcortical structures and circuits that mediate very basic emotional and mnemonic 
uh, memory and other uh, functions. And so the ability now to have a greater understanding of the circuitry to be able to get beyond, which is our hope, descriptive diagnoses and subjective reports of patients to be able to develop biomarkers, not just brain imaging, but genetics, genomics, increasingly proteomics, metabolomics, uh, all the omics, and to start to put it together. That's our challenge right now. I don't want to overstate where we are, and we'll all talk about the strengths and limitations of the current situation, but the ability to uh, develop a biological taxonomy, to therefore uh, have more targeted approach to therapeutic development beyond serendipity and Me Too drugs, and the ability to even identify risk and resilience factors that may be able to predict um, a person's risk and uh, outcomes and to be able to intervene earlier. These are all things that I think we're very hopeful for, as well as understanding mechanisms beyond the monoamines, having to do with everything from inflammation to um, GABA and glutamate, and then also being able to integrate cognitive behavioral approaches and an understanding of social psychology and neuroscience with the, uh, the biology as well. Thank, thank you, David. Um, so to start, I wanted to just throw out a sort of a framing question to, to every one of the panel, um, which is that many of the, uh, uh, many uh, companies um, have been, uh, have not been eager to uh, pursue psychiatric treatments. And uh, we, we heard in the last session um, a figure uh, that moderator Meg Terrell cited that uh, uh, venture capital, uh, capital investment in psychiatric indications is 10% or less of what is uh, invested in oncology. Um, and uh, in talking to you and in, in, uh, many of you uh, last week, though, I heard one message loud and clear, which was that we have many unmet needs in psychiatry. And uh, so what is the one, and so there's a disconnect there between what's uh, the amount of um, work going on by, uh, by industry and what the needs are. So what is the one thing that should compel pharmaceutical and biotech companies to get back into psychiatric research and development and to developing therapies for psychiatric disorders? And I'll start with you, Deborah, both because you're sitting next to me, but also you are, <laughs> you are actually one of the companies that, uh, that is pursuing some of these um, uh, treatments. So, so what should compel us to be in the area is that there are people who need new therapies, and there really haven't been that many in some of the psychiatric diseases literally for decades. So, you know, the last panel really made a point about yeah, it, the investment will come back when we have a better understanding of biology, but in the meantime, these, these patients are, are simply not treated. And when I look at that disparity between, you know, I think Meg quoted the ni over nine billion um, invested in on oncology, and it's probably more than that, versus the 900 million in, in psychiatry, you say it's impossible for the field to make the advances without investment. So, so it is a, a sort of a vicious circle. So yes, investment is needed. Yes, we need more understanding of the biology. But one of the other things that I'm so struck by, having spent 25 years, of, almost 25 years of my career in cancer I and moving into the, the space of the, the psychiatry and neurosciences, is the ability of patients in other fields, AIDS, cancer, uh, to advocate for themselves and to compel um, investment to, to make that compelling story and the, the inability because of their disease of patients with mental health illness to, to do the same. The, the very ability to advocate is affected by their disease and I think that's another component um, that, that makes the investment underrepresented and I'm so grateful to patients who speak out about their conditions um, we're working in the field of schizophrenia, and that's one of the most, the, the diseases that scares the general population just by its nature. It's a, it's a very scary disease. People don't want to engage with it. So I'm always grateful when people speak out because that advocacy, I think, will, will draw in investment as well as all the drivers towards understanding the biology, which I think are, are, are critical and which, of course, you're 
doing a tremendous amount of work on. Richard? Well, you know, yesterday we, we heard Mark Fishman talk, talk about the strategy of looking at areas where you have big unmet uh, needs and, uh, and the opportunity to treat those conditions. Well, you know, neuropsychiatric conditions are really kind of ideal for this. And yet, uh, we, as you mentioned, you know, the, there's underinvestment in this area. And part of it, I think, has been uh, the fact that many drugs have dropped out in phase three for, uh, for often very high placebo response rates. Uh, and, and people have been discouraged by the last kind of the, the, the failure, you know, in the, last, uh, in the last period of drug development. But, you know, I think that things have changed dramatically. We now have new methodologies to reduce placebo response. We can really kind of um, uh, uh, manage that issue very effectively. And I think that, in, in my opinion, we should see a lot more um, efforts in the area of, of neuropsychiatry because uh, this is an exciting uh, moment. As we kind of go, I think David has alluded to it, you know, drug, drug discovery can come from serendipity and we, we should not uh, downplay that role uh, that traditionally has, has kind of uh, has led us to many treatments uh, to uh, discovery based on biomarkers and neuroimaging and understanding the circuitry and discovery based on genetics where you, you start, you identify targets uh, based on, on, on genetic findings and you're looking at pa pathways that are affected by those genes. Well, in, in psychiatry we're really, and, and neurology, we're really starting to accumulate a substantial body of, of evidence that can lead us to those targets and we just have, you know, to invest in it. Corey? I would, uh, I would certainly echo the notion that unmet medical need is probably the thing that should motiv motivate us all. Um, I, I think beyond that, uh, the notion of being able to dig into some of these targeted patient populations uh, where you have a much higher chance of success in your trial, um, I think that's something that, uh, that the pharma industry should be very excited about. Um, I, I think from the perspective of uh, pure uh, technology developments, uh, one of the things that we're most excited about at PAIR and one of the things that I'm personally most excited about uh, is the opportunity to create therapeutic software uh, in mental health and specifically in psychiatry. Um, psychiatrists have a, a very, very interesting position in sort of the broader healthcare landscape in that they're one of the few clinicians who are actually able to impart a therapeutic service just by speaking with a patient. Uh, so some form of therapy, be it CBT, be it exposure therapy, be it anything else, uh, that's directly an intervention. And we're just beginning to see the emergence of arguably the most powerful healthcare tool around, which is the smartphone, uh, being able to recapitulate many of these forms of in-office therapy. And so if I'm a drug developer and I'm putting my chips on the table, uh, that does, does a number of things for me. Number one, uh, it allows me to track response in real time and to log that uh, both in the context of a clinical trial uh, so that I can more accurately demonstrate success versus failure. Uh, it also allows me to do that in the real world so that I can take that data and broadcast it to payers uh, in order to drive the financial uh, aspect of drug development at large. Um, outside of the tracking and monitoring aspect, uh, many of these interventional pieces of content uh, also uh, activate the right brain circuits uh, such that uh, these different neurochemical interventions can be directly more efficacious. Um, and that creates a huge opportunity for a new set of commercial products, uh, and I would argue uh, really puts us in a very, very interesting position to be developing some new compounds for the brain. Good. David? So in, in terms of uh, the, the curious and perhaps understandable uh, uh, divestment from uh, in, in many companies from this area, um, the reasons have been alluded to, but I think we are now coming to a point where people who are uh, really thinking about it uh, over the horizon, even in the near term, will see tremendous opportunity. We're dealing with the most complex functions of the most complex organs, so of course it's the last field to mature compared to the heart or the kidney. Um, that said, we are getting traction now. And I think part of the issue, as was alluded to, is a residual stigma. And frankly, underlying that is a residual dualism, I think. 
where people just still have a difficult time understanding the mind, uh, the brain is the organ of the mind. And, um, and the opportunities now that are before us, I, I think are really great because we're able to understand these diseases in a different way. And indeed, they're not single diseases. Schizophrenia, depression, these aren't homogeneous entities. And uh, the ability to understand the variance within a syndrome, to characterize it down to subgroups or even individual patients ultimately in terms of personalized medicine, just like cancer. Uh, there's no reason why that can't take place. And indeed, the foundations are being laid right now. And indeed, even cutting across traditional descriptive diagnostic lines of mood disorders, psychosis, uh, anxiety, uh, the, uh, there's reason to understand now that we're able to identify final common pathways of symptom expression and disease expression phenotypically that will be targetable. Good, and I, just to follow up on that, uh, to, to what extent is the, uh, you mentioned the sort of the historical dualism of mental health uh, uh, versus uh, bio supposedly biologically based diseases, but to what extent is the payment system still slowing down you know, um, that the insurance tr uh, still treats many, in many cases, mental health as separate from, yeah. from other diseases. Is that also It's a uh, huge issue. I mean, the, uh, in, in my department and, uh, you know, at MGH as well, uh, the clinicians don't even pay for themselves, which is terrible, uh, in, even despite the parity laws. Uh, what that means is, their salary plus fringe is not covered even by 100% clinical activity because of the poor reimbursement and the disparity in reimbursement for these disorders. That also carries over because it means that there's no clinical margin to then be able to uh, put towards academics or research and development, et cetera. I'd like to follow up on a point you made, uh, David, about as we understand the mechanisms and they, they cross broadly um, particularly of some of the symptoms, and that's an, an area that, that we certainly are focused on at Forum in cognition and the underpinnings of cognition across different disease states. Um, and we're seeing that the same uh, system of synchronizing the, the neural networks will drive an improvement in cognition in, in different diseases. And so, you know, we're moving forward in schizophrenia with the, the cognitive domain, uh, but also in Alzheimer's and then potentially you know, if that's successful, we could move into major depressive disorder. So I, I really do think that as we understand the, the systems of the brain better, it will enable us potentially to cross over or to narrow down um, as we understand the biology better. Yeah, I completely agree, uh, Deborah. You know, in fact, uh, there's a lot of interest uh, uh, at the National Institute of Mental Health on the kind of the RDOC uh, criteria as a novel approach to uh, to kind of study uh, psychiatric symptoms and diseases. Um, there's a lot of industri industry interest in that concept because we're starting to see drugs that are being developed more for targeted sets of symptoms or pathways as opposed to uh, the more classical kind of diagnostic criteria. So you could have, in some ways, in theory, drugs that are more specifically pro-cognitive <laughs> across a, a number of conditions. Um, uh, and, and that's kind of a, a, a novel aspect, in my opinion, in drug development. Uh, um. hmm. Interesting. Uh, Maritza, just to, um, I wanted to see um, what you can tell us about um, what's exciting you with antidepressants. It's, you know, as everyone knows, there's really been no fundamentally new antidepressants in decades, and are, are you seeing some, some exciting changes in that? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, you know, we're, we're starting to see a lot of activity, uh, both in phase two and phase three. You know, for the past uh, 50 years or 60 years, all the antidepressants that have been approved have been fundamentally monoamine-based therapies, whether MOIs, tricyclics, SSRIs, SNRIs, they were all fundamentally uh, deriving from these molecules discovered by serendipity that affected the monoamine system. Uh, so we're starting to see now finally uh, compounds that uh, target other systems. Uh, now interesting enough, uh, 
uh, one of the targets uh, is uh, uh, glutamate was uh, discovered by serendipity by Rob Berman and colleagues at Yale. They did a trial of ketamine um, and, and uh, found this, uh, you know, uh, very sur kind of surprising, very rapid antidepressant effect of ketamine intravenously at low doses. And, and now you have uh, companies like J&J, &J, uh, you know, studying as ketamine in phase three uh, for, uh, for intranasal for depression. You have Norex uh, with, uh, um, with Glic-13, which is a, a glutamergic compound, um, uh, also looking at depression. And then uh, you have uh, companies like Roche uh, looking at uh, uh, NGLUR5 uh, modulators um, uh, for depression, and then AMPA modulators being developed by a number of companies. So I would say that glutamate, definitely, it's a very exciting target in depression, depending on how, uh, you know, what compounds you're looking at. Uh, the other area is just the... Just can you explain how, how does the glutamate uh, system work, or do we understand the mechanism of well, I think how that it affects depression? You know, there were uh, <coughs> the first proponent, really, of a glutamergic theory of depression was Phil Skolnick in 1990, kind of wrote a seminal paper on, on really kind of the, the role of glutamate, and, and, and they hypothesized that antagonizing receptors of, of the one of the glutamate receptors, the MDA, will lead to antidepressant effects. And uh, ketamine, which is an MDA receptor antagonist, does, does that, does certainly induce a very rapid antidepressant effect. But then there are other receptors of the glutamate family that may modulate uh, that system and may lead to uh, potentially very rapid antidepressant effect. Right now, if I put a patient on antidepressant, it will take three, five, six weeks to see a response. Uh, getting a response within 48 hours is extraordinary. It's an it's a, a extraordinary innovation. So if we can get drugs that address the issue of speed and efficacy, because many of these drugs that we use currently work in less than half of the patients when you start someone on an antidepressant. So uh, glutamate is one. The other area that's more... Uh, related to biomarkers is uh, neuroinflammation, so compounds that have uh, anti-inflammatory effects uh, 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 may, you know, prove to have uh, an antidepressant effect. And then drugs that uh, modulate the opioid system. Uh, probably the most advanced compound is being developed by Alchemis, um, which combines uh, buprenorphine with, uh, with Alx-33, which is a mu antagonist, to modulate the op opioid system uh, with a, with a uh, kind of a cap antagonism, and and uh, that compound now right now is in phase three, um, with uh, Seracor developing in phase two a selective cap antagonist. So uh, we're starting to see a lot of non monobeam based therapies being developed, um, and and we're very excited by it. Mm -hmm. To ask you an, yes, please, another please. question, you, you spoke about the reduction of the of the placebo effect in the in the trials because there was an old sort of adage that if you're going to develop an antidepressant, you had to probably do five trials to get two positive. So so how are, how are we addressing that with some of these new mechanisms? Not that the mechanisms will do it themselves, but the clinical design. Well, y you know, the uh, if you look at, for example, the Alchemy's program, uh, it utilizes a design. Of course, I'm biased because. I'm one of the co-inventors of that design, <laughs> but it's <laughs> called sequential, <laughs> sequential parallel comparison design, or SPCD, which has been shown to reduce the placebo response quite significantly. So they're using, they used it in phase two and they're using it in phase three mm -hmm. to exactly address the problem of the, of the excessive placebo response. Hmm. Because that certainly will bring investment forward if we can get that. What I hear from investors a lot is they're, they're afraid of neurology and psychiatry to a degree because of not seeing the translatability of good phase two data into good outcomes in phase three. And that's incredibly scary because of the scale of investment in, mm -hmm. in phase three. So this is gonna be an important innovation yeah. too. Uh, and David, there's also I think there's been a lot of attention uh, to PTSD and anxiety disorders. Um, 
you know, largely driven by the return of soldiers from uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, but of course, it's, these are not just issues, not just confined to, to veterans. Um, what, uh, how effective are the current PTSD treatments and what, what new therapies or developments are on the horizon? Um, and what are we learning from basic science uh, and brain imaging about the fear circuitry that's uh, helping us to figure this out? Sure. So um, right now, as you say, there's a lot of attention on PTSD uh, as there is on TBI, traumatic brain injury, and, and the, uh, the convergence of the two in some cases. And what we're learning is that the evolutionarily conserved fear circuitry that in an adaptive fashion allows us to detect threat and to mobilize for it, whether it's in a fight or flight response or a freezing response, or to remember with one trial learning uh, something that was dangerous that we had better not be exposed to again, if at all possible, um, that that system in people who are vulnerable and or in people who are exposed to an overwhelming stressor um, becomes malfunctioning, hyperactive, hyperreactive, uh, in addition to other things. The fear conditioning models worked out in animals by Joe Ledoux and Mike Davis and others, and then work that we and uh, other people have done, uh, wonderful, you know, many different groups uh, have, have done work on this now, uh, really validates the notion that this circuitry is implicated and that there are different components to the circuitry. There's the amygdala, uh, and particular nuclei within it, the basal lateral and the central nuclei with particular functions and connectivity to other brain regions that's involved in fear conditioning. There's the ventral or anterior hippocampus that's involved in the contextual aspects of, uh, which is why you can remember where you were and what you were doing when the Boston Marathon bombing occurred or 9-11 or something like this. There's the orbital medial prefrontal cortex at the base of the brain in the front that's very involved in modulating. Whoa, yeah. talk about oh, that. Yes. Yeah, yes, absolutely. I remember that. Uh, <laughs> startle response, yeah, I'm, I'm autonomically activated now. That's a, or caffeinated, I should say. Um, so there's the uh, orbital medial prefrontal cortex that's uh, involved in modulating and inhibiting, in some instances, these more limbic uh, reactive systems. And so what that means is that gives you inroads into uh, rational therapeutic development. It also allows us to understand how certain existing treatments work. For instance, SSRIs, which are thought to uh, work more on the quieting down of the emotional reactivity, uh, if you will, part. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is more reliant on top-down modulation with prefrontal executive cortices uh, damping, dampening down the, uh, and learning the skills to dampen down the emotional reactivity, et cetera. Then if you dive another level into the biology, there's fascinating new approaches of understanding what's called reconsolidation. Uh, it used to be thought that when you have a memory that it is fixed and you always call it up and it's always the same. But what neuroscience now is understanding is that at the level of these systems and at the level of plasticity, that these memories are mutable and that the emotional component and the semantic or episodic memory component may be dissociable. So that there's now work uh, at many uh, places, in including uh, wonderful work at McLean, to, uh, to see whether there are methods or, or ways chemically of interrupting this process uh, and, and uh, interfering with the memory trace in the first place uh, being so affectively um, uh, valenced, we would say, uh, so that you could still remember what happened but not be so affected by it or mobilized. And then, uh, or enhance forgetting, if you will, the active extinction uh, process of the, uh, the memory uh, and, and thereby allow people to have a therapeutic benefit. Uh, if I could say one other brief thing, that's the PTSD component. And part and parcel of, of this whole approach that we've been talking about 
is understanding that all anxiety is not the same. In fact, the latest DSM, uh, despite its limitations, has seen fit to split off OCD, which is more of an impulse control disorder, from the, quote, anxiety disorders where it, it had lived uh, previously. And that makes sense in terms of the circuitry that mediates the obsessions and compulsions repetitively uh, in, a, in a broken wheel in the brain. And then uh, we and others are finding that panic disorder has a separate signature yet again, which should not be surprising. Instead of an external threat, like post-traumatic stress disorder to the organism, it's internal threat and autonomic storms that occur. And so what we're seeing with our brain imaging is that the higher order brain systems that mediate, or middle order systems that mediate uh, the, uh, the regulation of the autonomic nervous system and its reactivity to the environment are at play there. And then finally, more generalized anxiety disorder, which may be more of a prefrontal rumination problem uh, rather than a, uh, a threat problem in a different sort of way. Hmm. So are, is, all, is this um, more detailed understanding helping us find treatment? It is, um, and there's evidence of that already, and a lot of us are working hard to, to, to lay the foundation for the next generation of treatments because f even for reasons that I just mentioned or with the examples that I just gave, that gives you separate targets where all of a sudden you can stratify and have a separate prefrontal target for uh, generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, you have different types uh, of targets and inroads to the PTSD. Um, we can look at areas in orbitofrontal cortex and the insula that may be more involved with panic attacks and panic disorder. And then you can zero in, whether it's with brain stimulation, non-invasively or invasively, whether it's with more specific pharmacology with our basic science colleagues, where we say, look here, uh, what receptors and subtypes of receptors are expressed in this particular area of the anterior insula uh, on the uh, non-dominant hemisphere of the brain, for instance, um, and or what sort of cognitive behavioral therapies or even mindfulness, which we're looking at now in terms of the brain modulation, that allow one to, to work through uh, conscious volitional prefrontal mechanisms to, uh, to modulate. Good. I'm, I'm glad you brought up cognitive behavioral therapy because I um, want to talk about that uh, some. Um, last week there was a study, uh, a UK study published in the journal Lancet that reported that mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy was equivalent to antidepressant medication in treating patients with recurrent major depression over two years. Um, so do we um, know, are we have we figured out how CBT is working in the brain to achieve these um, successes? And um, have we also just figured out or are we able to discern which patients might benefit more from CBT, say, than from or from antidepressants? So is it, yeah, go I ahead. If Mauricio wants to answer or else, yeah. I'm happy to answer uh, or anybody who I can. Which is relevant to. Uh, yeah. Uh, to your company, right? And to a certain extent, the combination of, so I don't know if you want to take sure. it. Sure. No, yeah. I, I, mean, I, I would certainly let you speak to the uh, mechanism of right. CBT and which patients are most apt to respond. Uh, that said, I think at a very, very high level, the trend that continues to emerge here is that uh, antidepressants plus CBT seems to be better than either one alone, uh, really sort of nailing home this idea uh, of multimodal therapy. And in many senses, uh, that won't be true in some nuanced cases, so that there will certainly be some patients for whom uh, one or the other uh, is more efficacious. Uh, but when you take the population at large, uh, the combination does seem to be directly more efficacious than either one alone. And there are other combinations that, that are effective as well. There's evidence that decycloserine, uh, which enhances plasticity neurochemically, uh, and LTP, uh, long-term potentiation, can accelerate, in some cases, enhance the activity uh, or, or efficacy of CBT. There's some early evidence that uh, TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which through electromagnetic means uh, uh, enhances plasticity in combination with these psychosocial interventions um, can be uh, more potentially, uh, can, can facilitate the effect. But, you know, but I, w I would go back to something that uh, Deborah mentioned, which I think is critical. You know, in, uh, when you look at, uh, for example, conditions like uh, anxiety disorders as the ones that uh, David has, has mentioned, 
there is a perception that um, that we uh, that the treatments that we have uh, uh, are adequate, and we don't really need any more treatments. And and so um, so for example, uh, as far as I can tell, there's almost uh, almost nothing in development currently, uh, you know, in phase two and phase three for conditions like panic disorder, generalized anxiety, as if in some ways we should really be satisfied and say that's it, you know, we between the benzodiazepines and the antidepressants, we, I think we, we, we have it under control. The reality is that as, as a clinician, we know that we're not addressing many, uh, many of these conditions adequately. They're often resistant forms of, of these conditions that lead to, uh, you know, impairment, and yet we're not investing in drug development in these areas. Partly it's the placebo effect that has kind of deterred people, but part of it is that there's not enough kind of advocacy you know, I, I, you know, uh, I think an, an example is PTSD. We have so many soldiers coming back with PTSD. If if they come back with a, an infectious disease, or I, I guarantee you, we would be all over drug, you know, drug development. But because it's, uh, it's PTSD, you know, we're uh, the number of treatments uh, under development for PTSD is very, very small, mm -hmm. and yet it's a devastating condition. You know, suicide remains one of the major causes of death for our soldiers uh, you know we uh, you know the and even for the general population we have f you know 50,000 suicides every year and yet we we think that we shouldn't develop more treatments yeah. I think that comes comes to the biology too and I, perhaps with the functional imaging and then figuring out what what underpins the pieces that are lighting up um, we can we can give people targets to work on because I think that's what we we heard in the investor panel. You know, show me a show me a target, and show me what it does, and connect the two via animal models that work and into humans, and then we can go after it. Yeah. So, and, and I forget who it was. I, I, I think it was J. F. Formella that was saying we don't fund science experiments. And that's, you know, the depressing thing about NIH funding falling is that the science experiments need to sit with you so that you can tell us where to go. Yeah. Uh, we're good at, in the industry at drug discovery and development, but, but you know, target discovery has really been the, the f uh, frame for the, a for the academic mm -hmm. world. I'm very excited about what the functional imaging of the brain can really help us do because it gives us that window that we've maybe had in other fields, um, in cardiac disease and cancer, for, for quite a while that we, we never have had in the brain. Do, is the imaging, there has been a lot of development in imaging, but is it good enough or do we need to get even more fine grained with what we see with imaging? Um, there's been a lot of development and there's always a lot more to do. So, um, you know, there was first structural imaging and the ability with CAT scans to be able to see the nervous system uh, in, uh, in slices in three dimensions <coughs> was I incredible. Uh, and then MRI in terms of structural. Um, within MRI, now there's diffusion tensor imaging that allows you to look at the, the cabling or the white matter tracks within the brain. There's morphometry and methods to look at the thickness and size, even shape uh, of the gray matter in the brain. There is the ability to, uh, to drill down with higher field strength and, and get better in terms of resolution. Uh, but it does not give you microscopic resolution uh, for which you then need to go to other techniques that you can use. Although MR microscopy, uh, there, there are some developments there. On the functional side, the real breakthrough was with uh, spec scan and PET scan. And in the 1980s, the ability to look at glucose metabolism as an index of neuronal activity distributed spatially in the brain. And then the developments with uh, O15 PET uh, and then MRI, functional MRI, uh, with arterial spin labeling and bold MRI to be able to look on the order of seconds at brain activity uh, with resolution on the order of uh, millimeters. Um, when you want to go faster, which is very important because the brain computes on a, on a quicker, uh, more rapid scale, then we need to go to MEG, magnetoencephalography, uh, electroencephalography, 
but the limitations there are that they are surface measures. Um, there's then uh, optic, optical imaging, but still limitations in humans, and even optogenetics, which is a revolution now in, on the animal level, and the hope that, uh, that there may be in the future human um, sorts of applications. But it's a work in progress, and really signal to noise, uh, spatial resolution, temporal resolution, those are the, um, mm -hmm. the core elements that still need to be improved. I think that the, uh, in, in addition to neuroimaging, I think uh, I would not uh, kind of uh, underestimate the impact of uh, genetic uh, discovery. We're starting to see in neuropsychiatric conditions that uh, GWAS are really generating kind of indications for pathways affected in specific disorders. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we're starting to see companies uh, developing uh, 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 drugs and treatments uh, targeting those pathways specifically. Uh, and, and it's even more powerful as a tool when you combine neuroimaging uh, and uh, genetics together. You know, I see in the audience Dr. Smoller, who's uh, co PI of a Superstract project uh, with, uh, with Randy Buckner, which um, really combines genetics and, and, uh, and uh, neuroimaging. And in my mind, uh, that really is one area that could really excite in industry and biotech where you're starting to unveil targets based on a combined approach of genetics and neuroimaging. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to, to highlight the, the real gap here, which is maybe not necessarily finding markers, it's finding targets. So, uh, you know, I, I think we have lots of markers. Um, we have all of these imaging-based <coughs> signatures and neurogenetics gives us a pretty good idea who will respond to what and how people will behave. The issue is that those things just are not um, immediately druggable. And so as we survey the brain, we find circuits which are pretty largely molecularly homogeneous, and we don't have a way to get at them. And we find target genes which are more than likely active during development that set up the circuit in the first place and which in and of themselves are not directly druggable at the time of disease. I think if we want to think about, you know, what is the penicillin of mental health, what is the immuno-oncology of mental health, I think we have a pretty good idea what it is because we've seen it in animal experiments in the last five to ten years. It's optogenetics. It's finding uh, a genetically predefined circuit. It's being able to turn it on and turn it off at your whim and do the loss of function, gain of function behavior experiment uh, in a patient to make symptoms go away, come back, go away. Um, I think we're very far from being able to actually implement that in patients. Um, but that's where we should be headed. Um, I think on the other side, when we talk about the things that really excite us, um, and, and we're probably more guilty than anyone on the stage here, we're developing uh, a program around decycloserine, which you mentioned earlier. That's a tuberculosis drug from the 1950s. Um, it's incredibly dirty. It tickles the NMDA receptor in lots of ways that we don't even begin to understand, and that's state of the art. So, so it's not to come up here and stir the pot and say that things are terrible. Um, but we're a long way away from having druggable targets here. Yeah. I think one yeah, way David. of bridging that gap, and, and Maurizio alluded to the sort of fMRI genetics, uh, another way is the use of PET scanning and molecular imaging that allows you sub-nanomolar discrimination of receptor-specific or molecularly specific or metabolically specific um, uh, species and gives you spatial localization and allows you to look at state and trait across, uh, uh, across different groups. I, I would say, and, and perhaps um, uh, being on the academic side, it maybe the, um, by definition we're a little bit more <laughs> hopeful, and, and on, on the clinical side, the, that, that deep brain stimulation and TMS now, as proof of principle anyway, with small ends and still experimentally and with all the caveats and limitations, do provide the sort of uh, target engagement, uh, turning on and off, uh, activation inhibition, change of even subjective reports. Uh, Helen Mayberg and others work uh, on deep brain stimulation of the subgenual cingulate and the, the subjective reports of patients when you turn on and off in a blind fashion. Uh, work out of Germany uh, uh, stimulating the ventral striatum nucleus accumbens region and uh, some of the reports uh, reproducibly of patients on the operating table uh, of changes in anhedonia or, uh, or motivational uh, sorts of, uh, of uh, mindsets or behavioral sets. 
Um, so a lot more work to do, for sure. Uh, convergence uh, getting there. Sort of the challenge and the opportunity that people need therapy now so we're working on you know what you're working on if that's going to be a, a benefit to patients today we're working in cognition clearly there hasn't been therapies for cognition and schizophrenia absolutely essential and will continue to be essential but I'm, I'm hopeful that the novel targets will also be more more available and tractable given that the technologies are advancing so I, I, I do think about this next 10 years as truly being able to be transformative in bringing forward new things. And yeah, it's going to take many years for those to actually come all the way through the clinic to, to the patient. But I, I think you need both. You know, push, push that frontier because it gives us places to go and investigate uh, new drug development. But don't stop doing things that can be beneficial to, to patients today, which is even though DCR, you know, psychoserine's old. Yep. Go ahead. I think you, 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 you know, you're absolutely right uh, that in some ways some of the things that David is alluding to are things that may be transformative of the field but may take 10, 15, 20 years. And, w I, you know, we, have, we can't, uh, you know, uh, wait for that. We have to kind of use uh, some of the knowledge we have now as about specific targets and so forth. I mean, uh, you know, you, I think your Alpha 7 compound is an example of that, something that you know, it's been known for some time to uh, uh, that, uh, you know, nicotinergic system is important in, co in cognition, but really, uh, you, you know, your company has brought it forward, testing it in schizophrenia, in, in, in dementia, and really kind of expanding. And I'm hoping that you guys are going to look at cognition and depression because, you know, uh, over, th you know, a third of the patients with depression, even when they respond to antidepressants, continue to have cognitive impairment, and, and that's an area that we know our current antidepressants uh, you know, do very poorly addressing that symptom. Uh, but you know, I'm curious, that we're, you know, how, how did your company in some ways focus on an area that has been neglected by uh, you know, the field for, for so long? I think, I think for Forum, it comes from, you know, we have a, a, a committed single investor who has had a vision for the need for new therapies and the patience to support the, the development. And so the company was able to really drill down and, and do things in a very uh, thoughtful fashion. I, I think about a, you know, Dana Hilt, the chief medical officer, and Gerhard Koenig, the chief scientific officer, are here who did, did the work. Um, so you know I claim no credit, but they're, they're the people who did it. And in thinking about just looking at cognition in some of the early work in schizophrenia, even at the, at the time we, we were looking at safety in combination with antipsychotics, and just saying, what does it do to cognition? And seeing on the, the EEG metrics of you know, the P300 and mismatch negativity change and saying, wow, what does that mean? And taking the next step in the scientific process and saying, okay, let's take it further. Let's use this to take us into a phase two B trial in schizophrenia. So I think we're, we're all building off, you know, some observations, some great science, you know, we, we know alpha-7 is important, a great molecule, one that actually can test the hypothesis, and then following the clinical observations, and then the, the opportunity to go, to go where the medical need is, into places like depression. Yeah. So it, but, but this company has been dealing with this for a decade, right? This is, this is a long cycle process that we're engaged in. Um, but I think that, that for all of us, the next 10 years is gonna be, a, a, I look forward to doing this again in 10 <laughs> years when we get in. But I know, David, you wanted to say something. No, I, I, uh, I, I just wanted to add that another strategy while we're waiting, so to speak, or just in general, although there's not as much of an economic incentive for it in some circles, is to look towards the known pharmacopoeia and drugs that are already approved for another indication, but that we have reason to believe have mechanisms of action that uh, engage the sorts of targets that we are discovering, and that uh, that, that is another uh, a possibility that's not mutually exclusive. A beautiful story about that at a forum out uh, second molecule, and it's not a psychiatry indication, but a, a neurology, frontotemporal dementia, you know, 
academic uh, researchers, Joachim Hertz, was screening all known compounds for compounds that would modulate progranulin, one of the proteins deficient in a, in a specific genetic mutation in this frontotemporal dementia population, found an HDAC that did that, but it didn't penetrate the brain. So again, building on the observation, the scientists at Forum said, uh, we do work in HDAC, let's make one that goes through mm. the blood-brain barrier, which they did, and now that is in going forward in, in clinical trials. So take what you know and work with it. Mm. Uh, speaking of which, Corey, you're doing some of that um, at your company, right, with um, in this area of, of therapeutic software. Sure, um, sure. Can you talk more about what your what Pear is doing with that. Yeah, absolutely, and arguably we think about nothing but filling the innovation gap. Um, I think we're uh, very much short-sighted and uh, certainly see the huge unmet medical need here. Uh, the notion behind uh, Pear and what we call the e-formulation uh, is to take existing approved drugs, uh, add them to therapeutic software-based interventions, uh, and to position them toward patients in ways in which the combination is directly more efficacious than either one alone. Um, sure, yeah. absolutely. And so we talked a lot about uh, decycloserine. Uh, so we're developing uh, an orphan program in combat PTSD, uh, which is a combination of decycloserine plus something called virtual Iraq. Uh, so we've been working with a gentleman out of USC by the name of Skip Rizzo. Uh, who's developed a way to digitize exposure therapy, which is a clinically validated form of therapy for post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, here, what he's done is to take something that's a lot like the Call of Duty game mechanic, uh, to put it into a virtual reality headset, and to be able to display uh, for a wounded veteran uh, their most traumatic memories, uh, such that uh, a clinician by the side of the veteran uh, can walk them through strategies to cope with those memories, and in the context of the cognitive enhancer decycloserine on board, uh, one is able to much more rapidly unlearn the traumatic memories uh, as opposed to just having decycloserine on board alone or just doing virtual Iraq alone. Uh, so that's one uh, very acute example uh, of how we're working toward impacting both brain chemistry and brain experience simultaneously uh, in order to enhance the efficacy of an already approved drug uh, granted, the caveat is that decycloserine is approved for tuberculosis and not post-traumatic stress disorder, um, but it is sort of a means of very, very near-term uh, repurposing. Um, you know, you work down our portfolio. Uh, we've got a program in depression, uh, a program in insomnia, uh, one in anxiety, uh, one, believe it or not, in schizophrenia that's actually able to enhance uh, outcomes as assessed by PANS uh, in the context of maximum doses of atypical antipsychotics. So essentially, two-arm study, uh, one set of patients is on maximum doses of atypicals, the other set of patients is on atypicals plus the software, uh, and you get a PANS bump from the combination of the two. Uh, so we've basically played that concept out across a portfolio, um, and the notion is we don't want to wait for the next 15 years for uh, remarkably new mechanism compounds to come to the market to impact this set of patients. Uh, we want to bring these things to market in the next three to five years uh, to fill that innovation gap. How much of a bump are you getting for patients when you do these combinations? The mm. easy cop-out answer is it depends. Um, <laughs> it's entirely specific upon the indication and the therapeutic software intervention. Um, that said, in many cases, these are very, very, sp uh, very significant bumps. So in the schizophrenia example, we're seeing about an 8 to 10% bump in PANS above and beyond. Uh, max doses and of atypicals, is uh, uh, positive and negative symptoms in schizophrenia, which is the approvable endpoint or one of the approvable endpoints uh, drug in the space. Um, that's the sort of thing where if this was a new mechanism therapeutic and you were doing an atypical versus your therapeutic, you'd get really excited about that bump. Um, in addiction, we're seeing roughly a doubling of days abstinent for the therapeutic software uh, versus, uh, uh, rather, the, the therapeutic software plus buprenorphine uh, versus buprenorphine alone. Uh, we're seeing a similarly significant bump when you look at drug plus software versus drug plus in-office intervention. Uh, so it's, it's in some ways counterintuitive, uh, but you're actually able to get a really, really impressive efficacy bump just by putting these two things together. Hmm. Do, um, I have a question here from the, the audience um, asking, can you speak more about developments in the passive monitoring space? Does anybody want to, David, do you want to take that on? So uh, we have a, a program in behavioral e-health, and, uh, and I think all 
you know, all the departments have uh, ventures in this area. Um, the, and as had, has been alluded to in this conference a lot, that the ability to monitor in vivo, in the real world, 24-7, digitally uploadable, number crunchable, quantitative uh, data about a person's behavior, or even things like skin conductance response, um, or heart rate or heart rate variability, which gives you a sympathetic, parasympathetic read and is related to stress and outcome and, and uh, medically even, in addition to psychiatrically, that, that these are transforming now uh, the, the possibilities uh, because you do have other endpoints other than the PANS or in addition to, uh, you know, the clinician or family observer or patient report. And uh, if we can monitor that a patient with bipolar disorder and manic depression, uh, you know, who may be um, in between appointments has a 30% spike in her motor activity and her spending, um, then we had better not wait till she <laughs> comes for her appointment uh, two weeks later if we can know that she's spinning into hypomania and may get out of control and, and we can then um, you know, uh, make the adjustment in, in her medication. But similarly, this gives you other sorts of endpoints or metrics that are objective for therapeutic trials and, and I think that'll be helpful as well. Yeah. The, uh, uh, one of the limitations of uh, our endpoints in psychiatry is often the fact that, you know, we interview patients at the, at the intervals and in between those intervals, we really don't know what happens except that, you know, it's a recall of, you know, how you've done in the past week and so forth. So many companies now are looking at um, uh, at both active and passive monitoring to have data that feed into an assessment of how patients are doing throughout the period of the trial to get a better sense of, uh, of all the things that uh, David has described. So methodologically, it's a great improvement. Now, the question is that from a regulatory standpoint, uh, can these endpoints really replace the traditional ones, uh, you know, as primary I think ultimately yes, but you know we're still in a phase of uh, b beta testing of these methodologies. Uh, but you know all I would say, all the major academic centers have now a very robust portfolio of uh, kind of uh, electronic kind of uh, 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 monitoring passive and active uh, in uh, in clinical research. Mm -hmm. How do patients feel about being monitored in that way? And are there any <coughs> privacy concerns? How, how does it all work? They actually like it. And it makes them, uh, obviously, I, I can't make a sweeping statement. You mm -hmm. would find people who feel all different ways about it. But, um, but these days, everybody has their cell phone at their side 24-7, really. And there's an app for everything. Mm -hmm. And an app for your mental health actually has which often can have a sort of wellness spin or component to it and uh, a way to engage your provider um, and clinician team uh, is, is something that, that they see as, uh, as beneficial. Yeah. We're seeing now uh, the success of the uh, Apple iWatch and uh, you know, g Google uh, developing this, uh, these apps. Uh, I think they're uh, they're uh, they're becoming very popular, so I think that uh, I agree with David that there's I, I don't think there is an issue of acceptability because uh, we're now used to in some ways uh, you know Amazon knows what we like <laughs> at this point uh, I don't think that we can we can take back uh, privacy. Uh, uh, that privacy <laughs> from Amazon right. <laughs> Do you know that said, there are privacy and there's HIPAA and all of that, and so yeah. anything that any of us would do would be consonant with, mm -hmm. with that. Sure. Yeah. Um, another question from the audience is uh, Scott Rausch of McLean Hospital mentioned yesterday that we're moving towards a disease model in psychiatry. What do you think are the pros and cons of this? Will it raise the risk of over-medicating less severe disorders when treatments such as psychotherapy have also proven effective? Anybody want to? jump in on that? 
Well, I think, I think uh, you, you know, your, your company is in some ways leveraging uh, non-pharmacological treatments to potentially reduce the doses or, uh, uh, so I think it, it, it kind of, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, I, this is a bit of a dangerous spot for me to comment amongst all of these prestigious psychiatrists. Um, <laughs> you know, that said, I, I do think that these non-pharmacological interventions uh, do have the ability to ultimately reduce dose. Um, and with a reduced dose, one can think about an enhanced safety profile um, and fewer side effects. Um, there are really interesting opportunities to tailor the dose response curves for side effects versus efficacy across uh, both the medication and the non-therapeutic, uh, the non-pharmacological intervention. Um, that said, I won't, I, I purposefully won't comment on the disease model of psychiatry. I think we don't need to worry as much about that, I think, because at first the model was too non-biological mm -hmm. and psychodynamic and, uh, and so forth. Then people worry that it, maybe it's too reductionistic, but really what we're talking about in all of us here in a rather fluid way is the realization now of the biopsychosocial model, but in a mechanistic way about how these things come together uh, epigenetically, uh, plasticity-wise, experientially, so that you can have a bad disease, quote unquote, or, or severe, I should say, uh, like schizophrenia, and we uh, are showing that CBT can move the needle there in addition to medications. Um, you can have something that is not a, quote, disease, but for which um, an SSRI can be very helpful. So I think the notion of worrying, uh, is it biologic, is it psychologic, uh, is it normal, is it abnormal, uh, I think those are debates that hopefully we're transcending now as we understand more about mechanism. Thanks. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about substance abuse, which is a, another big area. Um, and what are, um, are there new understandings of models of substance abuse? Um, and what are we learning about um, addictions and, and shared mechanisms um, uh, across uh, various substance uh, uh, addictions? Does well, I, I think that, yeah. uh, you know, <coughs> I've been very impressed by the fact that now a number of companies are moving into the substance use disorder field, uh, partly because of uh, kind of probably an, a, a, a very large body of evidence of brain circuitry abnormalities in, uh, in, ad, uh, in addiction and, and how uh, in some ways we may be able to manipulate those systems uh, pharmacologically and non-pharmacologically, so the, so I think that uh, that's an area that is generating very interesting novel targets uh, for uh, for addiction, and, um, and and so we're uh, I'm personally considering the tremendous impact uh, that you know uh, the substance use disorders have on, on uh, uh, you know on our society, you know the. Uh, the tremendous mortality tied to overdoses from drugs, uh, uh, from the chronic use of drugs, uh, from alcoholism, um, and fundamentally, you know, the treatments that we have currently uh, for, let's say, for pharmacological treatments for alcohol, uh, these are, are very old and uh, and uh, with uh, mo with modest success. Uh, so I think that, you know, I, I'm, I'm delighted to see that really there is movement in that, um, in that domain. Deborah, do you, do you agree? I mean, you must yeah. see the same thing. Uh, certainly, there's more people and more of the industry involved in, in new um, discovery than there has been in a long time. I just, you know, listening to the Secretary of Health and Human Services at lunch talking about the, the staggering number of prescriptions for opioids and, and the level of addiction, it's not coming a moment too soon <laughs> and we've got a long way to go. <laughs> yeah. And work by Eric Nessler and others is really showing that the ventral tegmental dopaminergic system and projections to the nucleus accumbens and subregions and related regions, um, that those uh, reward, fundamental reward circuits of the brain and motivational circuits um, and reinforcement circuits are being hijacked, literally, by these substances, which then uh, take over, biologically, um, 
to the exclusion of otherwise real life rewards, uh, relationships, work, uh, hobbies, etc. which is why people will often make decisions or have behavior that's out of their control uh, to seek drugs even though they are destroying those other aspects of their life. And so with those discoveries and with uh, some of the elegant work that's going on now, that does provide other targets. Also, uh, coming back to something Maurizio touched upon and, and, and just thinking about dual diagnosis of depression mm -hmm. and alcohol, for instance, or schizophrenia, cannabis, uh, bipolar, cocaine, people self-medicate. And uh, there are also certain sorts of reinforced behaviors. And the more we understand about the circuitry and the mechanisms, the more we realize that these are not comorbidities. It's not a coincidence, although in some cases, statistically, you have two common things that happen to impact a person or two sets of risk factors. But really, once we understand that these systems in the brain uh, are convergent and the, the ventral striatal system in, in depression, the, uh, the ventral striatal system in, in addictions, uh, it's no longer a coincidence and it's no longer a quote comorbidity. And we can understand mechanistically why these two behaviors or sets of um, symptoms are so associated and we may be able to target them um, with, a, with a single mm -hmm. approach. If I could also say that like in cancer, we may wanna take multiple approaches, um, not just in terms of software, drugs and behavior, but even with drugs and pharmacology, the same way as in cancer. You're trying to get at the tumor, you, once you understand the signaling pathway, um, you, uh, you try to get at the tumor um, through three different points in that pathway to stop it, uh, the more we understand about the, the biology of these systems, um, the more we can target not only the, the final common pathways of behavioral expression, but the pathophysiologies and even etiologies that then impact upon those pathways, whether they be neurodevelopmental or um, uh, inflammatory or otherwise. Corey, did you want to? Yeah, add I mean, something? I think we started the panel asking why should pharma be excited, and I think addiction very nicely embodies why pharma should be excited. So I think some of the work that um, was just cited here, uh, some of Eric Nestler's work, uh, that's directly the loss of function, gain of function experiment in knocking out a very small targeted population of neurons, showing that they dictate the behavior. So we have this type of a mechanistic understanding of many of these addictive disorders. Uh, you roll that into the very practical uh, issue, which is that endpoints are incredibly short in addiction, uh, and there's no sort of subjectivity uh, with regard to your endpoint. This is a urinalysis where you're either sober or you're not. Uh, this sets up a really nice opportunity to develop and monetize new therapeutics. Well, thank you, and um, the clock says we are out of time, uh, so I want to thank our panel for uh, their comments, and thank you.